Calloway, and the mother of all talk shows. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Calloway. Oh, Morocco, how do I love thee? Shall I count the ways? Shall I compare thee to a summer's day in 1975 when I first entered the Arab world through your portals and never lost the love of you? You have now beaten one European colonializing power after another with still one more to go. And billions of people across Africa, across the Middle East, across the entire Muslim world are literally praying for your success. Not just because you're carrying the Palestinian flag in an arena where the rainbow flag became emblematic of the Qatar World Cup, even though it was banned. Mixing politics with sport, anyone? I told you that rainbow would become a boomerang. And have Meghan and Harry gone mad? Or is it us that has gone mad in tolerating this soap opera farce for quite as long as we have? Matt Hancock, the minister responsible for a health service in which millions were afflicted, is quitting politics to make serious documentaries encouraging the right to die. I'm not making that last one up, though I'll have plenty to say about it in the course of my monologue. And Elon Musk buys not a social media company as much as a crime scene. Like a man who buys a hotel only to discover there are skeletons in every room, there's decomposing bodies in every room of Twitter HQ as the man buns in their man bags, their skinny jeans and their sneakers do a runner so fast they weren't able to destroy all of the evidence of their malfeasance. There's, of course, no show without the war which drags on and which turned over this weekend in a sinister direction. Russia is reviewing its doctrine of no first use of nuclear weapons. This as all kinds of new dirty secrets tumble out of NATO, not least from the handbag of Angela Merkel. It's all coming up over the next two hours because, of course, this is the mother of all talk shows. Curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. George Galloway. The mother of all talk shows. With George Galloway, the world is our classroom. And you're welcome to sit in and join the seminar. They tell me that Meghan and Harry are popular in America. I suppose in flyover uh, country, nobody much pays them any mind. But on the East and West Coasts, I can see how, why Meghan and Harry have become Hollywood favorites, chat show, sofa TV favorites. I have no favorite in the royal family. For me, the feud between Harry and William is Two bald men fighting over a throne, a comb. It is of no interest to me who said what to whom inside the royal family because I believe in a republic and I'm going to make the case to you now, right now, that those of you who are hottest under the collar about the madness of Harry and Meghan are the most vociferous supporters of the institution of monarchy. So ponder this. But for an accident of chronology of birth, Harry would have been your king and Meghan would have been your queen. They would have become the head of state of Britain. And yet you continue to leave to the capriciousness of the chronology of the birthing suite 
the idea of a hereditary head of state, the idea of an hereditary monarchy. Maybe, just maybe, who knows? William is the strong, silent type. Maybe, who knows? He can keep it in his pants. Maybe, who knows? He's going to be a wholesome father figure for the nation. I have my doubts about that, but maybe you're right, in which case you dodged a bullet. Do you want to take that risk again and again and again? You want your country in perpetuity to be in thrall to the roulette wheel of a head of state that isn't bonkers? Now, leaving aside Netflix, Bonanza with this latest that they spent a fortune on the crown. I doubt if they ever got that budget back, but they're sure quids in with Meghan and Harry in the latest soap opera on their brand on Netflix. Leaving aside the idea of Americans thinking the British are racist, that's a bit rich, I've got to tell you. With love to all our American viewers, a country that exists on the bones of a hundred million indigenous Americans whom they massacred and robbed, and then a country built on the literal enchained enslavement of millions of black Africans that until the 1960s still didn't allow a black man to piss in the same pot as a white man in a public restaurant didn't allow little Richard to stay in the hotel that he was performing in. Wouldn't let Sammy Davis Jr. stay in the same hotel as Dean and Frank. Spare me your sanctimony about racism. The country that bought us the George Floyd incident is not in a position to lecture anybody about racism. And as I've always said, not here for the first time, if you think Britain is racist, you've never lived in France or the Netherlands or many other European countries. And I didn't even compare us to the United States of America for that comparison would be frankly ridiculous. Leaving aside that although the British royal family are now routinely accused of racism by Meghan and Harry, they actually never give a single example of that racism and the examples that they give are actually the reverse of examples of racism. As I've said many times before, somebody asking what Meghan and Harry's children would look like is not making a racist statement. And if they are, my entire family and my wife's entire family are guilty of racism because all of them endlessly wondered what Gayatri and my children would look like. It's normal to wonder what the children of a mixed race couple would look like. Although Meghan herself is mixed race and the blackness of Meghan Markle's beginning to pale a little if you get my drift. But leaving aside the fact that they have not adumbrated a single example that passes any serious test of racism of the royal family, I say I damn them all. A plague on all of their houses, palaces, castles, and everything else that the British taxpayer is paying for, and not just paying for, but currently paying to heat. An Arctic winter just hit my country of Britain, and our people are in no position to resist it. They are in no position to warm their houses. Uh, their economic situation has passed from grave to critical. We are living on the edge of an ice age here in Britain and in Europe. And frankly, the last thing we should be talking about is the prince and princess of Montecito whose palace in the Netflix documentary isn't even their palace. It's actually shot 
in a $42 million property that's up for sale. Netflix just rented it. But the impression is given that the king and queen of Montecito are waiting over the water for the day when a grateful nation asks them to come back and perhaps usurp the rightful heirs to the throne. who are only rightful, of course, because they murdered a couple of children in the Tower of London. Ever hear of the princes of the Tower? Anyone? Matt Hancock, I have nothing personally against. I've only ever met him once. I sat in Parliament with him for some years. He was distinctly unprepossessing. If he and I walked along a corridor, nobody would have been looking at Matt Hancock in the, uh, in the spectacle, in the parade. He was a nothing burger, a nobody. But I did appear on BBC Question Time with him once in Gillingham, as I recall, and tore him a new one. I was amazed at the shrinkage of the political class implicit in the rise and rise and rise of Matt Hancock. But it came as no surprise to me that he turned out to be a catastrophic failure. It did come as a surprise that his publican got a 20 plus million pound contract to supply PPE, which may or may not have been amongst the nine billion pounds worth of PPE, that turned out to be completely worthless. It may be that the publican ends up in the dock along with Michel Moon, the conservative peer. How, what about an uplift, Michel? That's the uplift, that's the balcony bra of all corruption stories that you are now involved in, and I understand you're now living in Latin America. And it may be that you will not be able to come I was not surprised that Hancock completely and utterly failed the nation and is responsible for, at least prima facie, the deaths, unnecessary deaths, of many, many thousands of my fellow citizens. As I've said often, I don't want to see Matt Hancock in the jungle, on the television. I want to see him in the dock, at the old belly, charged with, at minimum, corporate manslaughter, criminal negligence. I hold him and his cabinet colleagues and the opposition front bench that backed them every inch of the way responsible for the unnecessary demise of so many of my fellow citizens. But I've got to say he hadn't touched bottom yet. Matt Hancock is about to become the face of a new campaign, which if you think about it, was ineluctable. A campaign to persuade us of the right to die. A campaign to persuade us of the joys of euthanasia. A campaign to pave the way from the semi-legal euthanasia that is currently being practiced in children's wards as well as in elderly wards in Britain today to the full pomp and ceremony of a legal euthanasia regime. Matt Hancock, I suppose he had to do something posthumous to his parliamentary career, but to become the new face of the ultimate capitalist campaign. People say to me, what do you mean capitalist campaign? If capitalism was a person, the person it would choose to murder is the person who will never again turn a cent of profit, who will only ever again be in the debit column as a cost, who will only ever again be a burden on the rest of us and on the rest of society. And Hancock's going with the grain because if you think about the individualization of society, the atomization of society, the death of religion, the death of organized socialist politics, then why not shuffle your elderly parents off to an elderly grave? After all their suffering, 
aren't they? They're a burden, aren't they? You can make them feel like they are a burden. That's for sure. I discovered just the other day my mother is sitting with an electric blanket plugged into the wall around her all day rather than put her heating on. The situation I hope to have corrected. But parents, grandparents, can easily be persuaded that they are merely a burden to the living. And from the point of view of the capitalist state, of course the cost of keeping elderly people alive until they're in their 80s, even 90s, even more, if you're in the royal family, then why wouldn't you want to encourage a state of mind amongst the chronically sick, amongst the severely handicapped, amongst the very elderly, weak and vulnerable and feeble, the ones that Matt Hancock shunted into old people's homes to die themselves and kill other people because he couldn't keep them in the hospital because the hospital was in such a state that my youngest child had to be born in a rubber bathing pool at the bottom of my bed in my bedroom because it wasn't safe for my wife to give birth in Matt Hancock's NHS. Elon Musk is doing the world a signal service. Who would have thunk that a billionaire who paid $44 billion for a $10 billion company would end up owning the house of horrors and then open all its windows and its doors to the rest of us so we can see what the so-called achingly liberal, achingly progressive pussy hat brigade had done to the public square. One that they boasted was a boon to humanity, but which turns out to have been a political conspiracy for their liberal, progressive, pussy hat politics. Every page that's turned in the Twitter files is completely horrifying, or ought to be. It's ignored in the so-called mainstream media because they're run by almost exactly the same kind of people as were running Twitter. And insofar as they manage to get outraged at what is in the Twitter files, they're outraged at the opening of the books, not what's in the books. Full disclosure, I am myself probably in February meeting Mr. Musk in court in Dublin, the jurisdiction of the company's headquarters, don't you know? They picked it for tax reasons. They didn't figure on having to meet me in the four courts of Dublin, but they will in February. And the window for Mr. Musk to mediate an end to this dispute of the false and defamatory labeling of me on my Twitter account, which has now libeled me more than 100 million times. That's quite a circulation, Mr. Musk. That's quite a width of libel. And if the judge decides that the width of the libel must be reflected in the final outcome of the case, your company is in very, very big, big trouble. And even a fleet of Teslas will not now solve this legal matter between us. But that notwithstanding, I have no quarrel with Musk. Musk is going through the Augean stable of Twitter like Hercules. He's at least going through it with the stiffest of brooms and exposing it to the disinfectant of sunlight. And what do we see? We see the grotesque figures of Hillary Clinton, of Michelle Obama, of the Secretary General of the State of Arizona, of sundry FBI officers all over the country in direct communication with a media company giving it orders, orders which were complied with in direct 
contradiction to the American Constitution. The First Amendment of the American Constitution makes every one of those actions an illegal act, an act, you might say, of rebellion, an act of treason against the Republic of vastly greater significance than a group of men in Buffalo Indian hats and necklaces dancing around the Congress on January 6th. I keep hearing the Liberals talking about Trump having unleashed violence on January the 6th, when the events of January the 6th would be a quiet Saturday afternoon on the Champs-Élysées when the French yellow vests are on the march and the French riot police are laying into them. Only two people died on January 6th and both of them were killed by law enforcement. But as Goebbels discovered long ago, if you repeat a lie often enough, people begin to believe it. Musk, I take my hat off to you, but I'll still see you in court in February in Dublin. Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night, as Betty Davis once said. And boy, have I got a power couple for you coming up next. Gosh darn, how do you get this thing to work? Ah, uh, is it that one? Is it, is it this one here? Gosh, was this thing built in America? Jeez. Kamala, would you get in here? I can't get the, uh, gosh darn wireless to work. <laughs> you know I can't answer questions, Joe, when I'm laughing. <laughs> I'm trying to, uh, listen to that Scottish guy on the wireless, the, uh, the, the Galloway fella. Oh, Joe, you're so funny. <laughs> I've been pressing this red button on and off and on and off. Heck, I can't get it to work. Uh, hello, Biden residence. Mr. President, be advised, we have executed the airstrike on Syria, uh, <laughs> That's just great. Uh, how long until it gets delivered? I'm starving. Let's take a call. Go ahead, Kenny. Hi, George. Yeah, I just want to talk about the trans issue that you were speaking about earlier. Yeah, I've got go a book in front of me by uh, Douglas Murray, and he's got a paragraph here. So I'd just like to redo it, if that's okay. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Okay. I was standing on the corner <laughs> at a quarter... All right, I'll, 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 I'll get him off, get him off. He's a nutter. He's a nutter. In the UK, it's 08081... 965-522, and in the U.S., it's plus one, eight four four nine four four double three double four. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Twelve thousand people have voted on this poll so far. Make sure you get your say. Should Meghan and Harry have their royal titles cancelled? You can vote on my Twitter. You can vote on my YouTube channel. Please subscribe. You can vote on my Telegram channel, t.me forward slash George Galloway. Or you may already have voted on the YouTube community poll. It's overwhelming in most, though on Instagram, interestingly. Uh, the answers are reversed, but should Meghan and Harry have their royal titles cancelled? Yes or no? Get voting. Now, it's a power couple hour, obviously. This show is brought to you by Gayatri and George Galloway. We're discussing Meghan and Harry Markle. And we're about to interview the greatest power couple in America. 
Clayton and Natalie Morris are the co-hosts of the absolutely outstanding show, Redacted. And I say that not just because I'm in the opening titles in my clash with Jackie Smith and Andrew Neil and the BBC. It is an absolute pleasure to meet you both. Hi from my wife. She's not on screen. Uh, our sponsor made her so beautiful. I'm too possessive and jealous. I can't put her on the screen. But it's wonderful to see you two here. Tell everyone, first of all, about Redacted, when it started. Clayton, when you got fed up getting up at three o'clock in the morning uh, for your, uh, your mainstream media TV gigs. Yeah, you know, we well, we both worked in the mainstream media for a number of years. I spent about 20 years uh, in, in broadcast journalism, waking up at like two and three in the morning as a morning television news anchor in the United States in the last 10 years at Fox News Channel. And I think it was, well, it was about 2017 when I decided, all right, that's enough. Enough is enough. It got crazy. It was time to be able to spend more time with our kids. And I realized that being able to step back from that mainstream media lens and be able to put together our own media company, focus on the stories that we wanted to be able to cover, cover the stories that mattered to us. And I think at the end of the day, it was how could we create a show that we would want to watch every day? Because there are stories that are just never going to be covered in mainstream television. Yes, but we both worked in the eco chamber of the media and we both were feeling sort of pulled from one side to the other. Um, and we left our jobs. We took some time to be out of media. Uh, we have an investing company, but I think that space really allowed us to see that the polarity of the media is not serving us. And so we started to uh, we read a lot, we researched a lot, and we started to see just how divisive everything is. And if you watch our show, we're, people say, we can't tell what side you're on. And that's on purpose. We're not on any side. We're trying to put context to stories that are coming across just to inflame us, just to make us like feel one way or the other and click things and share things. Uh, we're trying to do the opposite. We're trying to sort of slow down read context, read history, and present news in that way. And I think because we both had a lot of space in between our mainstream media jobs and this job that we gave ourselves, it's helped a lot. And your voice, I mean, thank you for letting us borrow your voice because in our show open and our audience loves it, when George pops up on the screen, we see in our comments, people go crazy for it because where else, I mean, you, you just do not get to see those types of stories, that type of coverage when you have people holding powerful people to account on a regular basis. They get silenced, they get censored, they get blocked, yeah. they get banished, they get uh, they get you know, taken off of YouTube, deplatformed, as we're seeing, of course, with all of these Twitter files, George. Yeah, uh, we're for the truth, no matter who it's for, no matter who it's against. And uh, I struggle with this all the time. People think because I am viscerally hostile to Joe Biden and the Democrats, that that makes me a supporter of Donald Trump and the Republicans, but I'm not, and I never have been. But Donald Trump and the Republicans are not in power. It's Joe Biden and the Democrats that are in power. And it's my job to hold those that are in power to account. And that's what uh, both of our shows try to do. Incidentally, we've also got three children and uh, perhaps unlike yours or perhaps like yours, Mine are actually standing at the door of the studio now trying to get in. So if they break in and disrupt the show, uh, please forgive us. Um, now, uh, this is a very, very revealing time, as you allude, Clayton. The, the Twitter files are showing us that everything is as bad as we feared it was except perhaps it's worse yes. than we feared it was. And of course you have give us your take. Well, just at a high level, you know, I think some of the response online has been, wow, this is, uh, well, it's in their terms of service, right? That's been one of the lines we've seen over the past few days that, oh, well, Twitter says right in its terms of service that if there are things that they don't like, they won't allow it to, to proliferate on their platform, which is just a, an absolute excuse and ridiculous because what it shows is that these powerful people in the media have been colluding with powerful people in the deep state. And when I say the deep state, I really mean the permanent government state. You know, when you have a Joe Biden, he's there for four years, maybe, maybe eight years uh, if we're unlucky. But there's a powerful entrenched 
there's a powerful entrenched uh, Washington, D.C. that is there permanently. And this backdoor portal behind Twitter and Facebook, the Twitter partnership yeah. portal, the Facebook partnership portal, where if you have a government email address, you can log in and you can send them a message and have people censored, deflat deplatformed and taken down. Right. I was reading uh, Douglas Murray's column this morning in the New York Post, and his headline is fantastic. It's Twitter's su suppression of Hunter Biden's laptop isn't a conspiracy theory. It's a conspiracy. And now we know exactly how deep that conspiracy went. A lot of this was actioned during the Trump administration. So you could see that even though Trump was in power at the time, the powers that be underneath him were actually working against him to get Joe Biden elected. Why is an interesting question. Well, we just fast forward the clock and now look, we're at war. We have a climate war on poor people. We have all kinds of policy now that is handing enormous amount of power to few amount of people and hurting the powerless the most. Uh, the, you know, the, like the reason is very clear here, but it's something that you see the cancel culture wants to look away. It's only, it's the biggest pivot I've ever seen in my life because this is the culture that loves canceling people, taking a look at this bad behavior, at the lies yeah. that Twitter executives were telling us that they weren't doing it and they were, and they really want to bend over like Gumby in order to not cancel these people, but they love canceling people. And it's, and it's what's amazing to me, George, is that the people that are that you would think would be really out there supporting free speech and you know absolutely staying away from censorship are exactly the ones now who are in support of censorship i'm really upset because i used to be a tech reporter i used to when i worked at fox news one of my side gigs was i would cover technology and i had a lot of tech reporter friends we would go cover you know google events or apple events and i always thought that these guys really stood for a free and open internet and boy have they disappointed me I mean, almost universally across the board, these people that I was friends with that would cover these events completely flipped. And they are absolutely on the side of calling Elon Musk crazy and saying, I can't believe that this platform is now open. And now we get to hear other side. They only liked hearing the speech that they aligned with. And that's one of the most troubling things to come out of this, I think. Yes, indeed. Uh, the liberals have become the tyrants and the conservatives hitherto regarded as tyrants in waiting uh, have become the champions of free speech, right and left is completely uh, turned upside down. Uh, but going back to Natalie's point, and this is uh, where it, in my view, is a crime and not just a scandal. Uh, of course, Trump was in office, but he was not in power. And being in office and power are two different things. The permanent state was in power and they wanted Trump out of the office and therefore the FBI, the security apparatus of the state and uh, including, of course, in places like Arizona, the actual government of the state, they were all in a conspiracy with Twitter, not just to get this, the serving president of the world's most powerful country kicked off a media platform, even though he had 80 or 90 million followers on it, even though it was in a pre-election period. Yes. Uh, but the, uh, the, the, um, the government is not allowed to uh, penetrate the, the, the media, the free speech space, give orders, have those orders complied with. That becomes an, a crime against the First Amendment, surely. Yes. And it's interesting because you would think then that mainstream media would want to distance itself from this. Instead, we see the opposite. We see mainstream media making excuses for it or ignoring it altogether or somehow trying to make a scapegoat out of Elon Musk. Um, you again, you would think that anyone who cares, who has a journalism degree, who studied free speech might say, no, this is absolutely imperative to a society that we have free speech. Uh, this is wrong. How are we gonna make sure? And you would also think that, that here's the story, the headlines that are blaringly absent is someone who's a journalist going to Facebook, going to Instagram and going to YouTube and saying, how'd you make these decisions? Now Twitter's letting us see, can we see yours too? Right. What happened there? 
I said supremely the supremely uninterested. I said the other day. Now instead of the Twitter files, the next I hope we see the YouTube files, and then I hope we see the next round of files. And will we ever see it? Of course not. And sad that we have to wait to to a billionaire buys a company before we see it. But it's um, like a room the, full of alcoholics, and one person is doing the AA, and the rest of them are still drinking in well, you, front of them. And you have 17 members of the CIA and the F, former members of the CIA and the FBI who then become a part of Twitter and are actually behind, you know, forget trying to infiltrate these newsrooms like we did in the 1970s, right? Now they're actively on the payroll of mainstream media. Vivek Ramaswamy in his great book called Woke Incorporated, he says that the power center now is not in Washington, it's in Silicon Valley. And I think you're absolutely seeing it in these Twitter files, George. 17 FBI and CIA officials were working at the headquarters of Twitter before Elon Musk. 51 uh, senior officials of the American intelligence and security community put their names and their faces to the now acknowledged fake assertion that the Hunter Biden laptop story was Russian disinformation. Yes. Now in tatters, no one is held to account. No explanation is given by the 51 as to why they thought, how they came, all of them, to the conclusion that they did now that they know that conclusion was false. Ditto the 1718 at the Twitter headquarters. They have never explained. In fact, until the last moment, Jim Baker, the former FBI senior counsel and then Twitter senior counsel, was expunging evidence yeah. of the material that is now in the Twitter files. Talk about a rear guard action as he was being huckled out the door. He was wiping uh, right. computer uh, files and, and uh, disks. Why is this not a bigger scandal, Natalie? I, I really can't put a point on it because, you know, this is the kind of thing you think of how we freaked out in the media collectively over, uh, you know, the Michael Cohen scandal, the Stormy Daniel, the Daniels scandal, uh, what Trump ate every single day, you know, the fact that he had five Diet Cokes for breakfast, um, all of those things the media loved to drum up like a hornet's nest and this actual government infiltration i my only explanation is is that mainstream media has the same thing happening inside of their newsrooms inside of their news feeds and they can't answer for it uh you know it, it's one of those things where like you can't have matt lauer covering me too this is exactly what's happening well and they're all run by liberals i mean th these organizations you, you mean to tell me that the, I mean, the Washington Post is going to cover this story? You mean to tell me that the same people that butter their bread are going to allow them to actually go and cover these stories? Uh, it's not going to happen. That's why we will have to rely on alternative media. That's why, I mean, there's 100 million Americans that don't vote in the election. They don't align with either party. They're absolutely disgusted. And we hear from them every night on our show that they don't, they, they've, they've stopped watching the mainstream media. They don't trust it. And they know that they're spinning a narrative run by these billionaires and these oligarchs who are running everything. So they're not going to cover this story. It would be a bigger scandal if they put, I mean, if they were allowed to cover it. No, I think that the, the way that they want to continue to cover it is the eccentricities of Elon Musk, uh, because that's clickable, it's actionable, people seem to understand it. This is very nuanced, especially for instance, the, um, the bit about the guy saying, I can't really hide these calendar appointments anymore. I'm trying to come up with these creative ways to put meeting with the government in my calendar, meaning he knew it was wrong, meaning he knew everyone else around him knew it was wrong. And he thought it was funny enough to come up with some subterfuge type names. And that's unacceptable. And we all should care. You know, we are free speech absolutists, meaning you have to protect the speech you don't like. And for some reason, one party seems unable to do this. And I can't understand, you know, I mean, I did sort of at the time feel like the the Hunter Biden story, I, I bought it, I took the bait thinking, oh, they're just trying to, you know, do something about Joe Biden's kids, because the Trump kids are so salacious. That's probably what this is. 
and Twitter doesn't want me to see it. And I threw it away at the time. Um, we weren't doing a lot of news reporting at the time. And so I know what that feels like to want to look away from something and then to come back around and see that I was told that for a reason feels like a betrayal. Yeah. And when you know the mechanism was in place, George, that this mechanism that they would never allow another Trump to happen again, that with the Media Matters crew and the George Soros funding and all of this comes together to raise $100 million to make sure that they could identify the mechanisms of how this alternative media provided Trump specifically with a victory. Then they started targeting those people, going after those people, deplatforming those people, making sure that the network of alternative voices and independent media that brought a Trump to power was actually decapitated. And that's what they've been doing. And so that's why these things, you're up against a massive money machine. And that's why this stuff doesn't see the light of day. Well, they haven't succeeded as long as we are alive. I've got to say, this has been a rare pleasure. Natalie Clayton Morris of Redacted. Tell us how people can watch your show. Well, we're on, we're on YouTube until they take us down. They've taken us down four or five times now. Um, so we are on youtube.com uh, slash redacted news. And then we're also on Rumble uh, at rumble.com slash redacted. We do a live show every day at 9 p.m. Uh, Lisbon time, Western, Western European time, which is uh, 4 p.m. Eastern time, Monday through Thursday. And so, uh, and we have an accompanying newsletter that goes along with the show as well. It's Monday through Friday. You can get it at redacted.inc. And I want to say the pleasure is ours too, because yes. many of times uh, we get on a road trip and Clayton puts your show on. Um, <laughs> so you are with us way more than just in our introduction. You've been with us um, on many road trips in our life and uh, we always enjoy your take. And when, I have, when I have a night off and I'm not doing my show, we'll, we'll, with a scotch sitting by the fire watching you. So just. <laughs> we'll, we'll, I'll tell you what, the next time we meet, it'll be in Lisbon. We'll take in some fado together. Thank you very much indeed for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. What a wonderful couple. Let me take a quick break and then we've got only got the MMA champion, Jeff Monson, wrestling with me, coming up next. The 1897 edition of War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells, read by George Galloway, available only on Patreon. The cylinder was artificial, hollow, with an end that screwed out. Something within the cylinder was unscrewing the top. Good heavens, said Ogilvy. There's a man in it, men in it, half roasted to death, trying to escape. At once, with a quick mental leap, he linked the thing with the flash on Mars. The thought of the confined creature was so dreadful to him that he forgot the heat and went forward to the cylinder to help turn. But luckily, the dull radiation arrested him before he could burn his hands on the still glowing metal. listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. I hope you're enjoying War of the Worlds on my Patreon page and I'm ready to take suggestions for what the next talking book I should do. They have to be out of copyright, of course, because otherwise I'd need to pay the publishers and H.G. Wells is well out of copyright and I'm reading from a 1897 edition of the story. It is a truly wonderful story. Patreon.com forward slash George Galloway. Now the poll is going good. Oh, should Meghan and Harry have their royal titles cancelled? Yes, 74% on Twitter. No, 26% on Twitter. Uh, yes, 76% on YouTube. No, 24%. And Telegram, yes, 71%. No, 29%. The only place 
where Meghan and Harry have a majority on the poll at the moment is on Instagram, which may speak volumes about Instagram. I really don't know. And as I made clear, don't really care. I uh, have made the point to you that the more angry you are about the antics of Meghan and Harry, the more relieved you must be that it was William that was born first and not Harry, for you would very soon be having to curtsy to Meghan. Just think about that. Super Chat is the way to fund Moats America, which I hope to launch on Friday nights in the new year. I won't be presenting it. It will be American presenters, American guests, and American topics, and so on. You can still watch it, of course, anywhere in the world, though it will be on late in your time zone because we want to maximize the American audience. As you will already have gathered, there's a very significant number of people in the USA looking for alternatives like the mother of all talk shows. If you want to help get that off the ground, if you're on YouTube, do it through the super chat mechanism. As Karim Al Nashi has just done £8.99. Thank you, Karim. Mr. Lover, who does it every single show, gives two British pounds. Red Star Betty, the name of the night, she gives three pounds. Daniela Modos Kuta gives £1.99. Give me one dollar, one euro, one pound. That'll do me. If you all give that, we'll be we'll be we'll be on air. In early January, Golden Silence gives two US dollars. GG, keep speaking the truth. Thank you. Otto Calvo gives 50 Norwegian crowns. Thank you. My good friend Teresa Kelly in the United States gives $10. James Warren in the US gives $2. Ange2099 gives two British pounds. Matthew Cooper, a Celtic man, gives two pounds and says, Hail, hail. That's our greeting between Celtic supporters. Galloway Raider, wow, gives £44.99 and says the Tory party are holding the people of Northern Ireland to ransom over winter payments. Totally disgraceful. What would you do if you were PM? How long have you got, Galloway Raider? Are politics more important than people? I know what side I'd be on. Keep up the good work, mate. Thank you very much for that most handsome donation. Darren Henry, 3.49 New Zealand dollars. Travelin Gale, two pounds. GG for PM in 2025, if not sooner. I'm not as young as I look, Travelin, but thanks for the thought. Remborn, 50 pounds, 50 British pounds, and that is a regular donation from Remborn. I really do hope to meet you, sir. Jason Stewart, £4.49. Another terrific show, George. I'm not surprised Clayton and Natalie Morris think with clarity like you. Great to see them on moats. Great indeed. Uh, Sailing Prepper, Dark Secrets, five US dollars. Love the Galloway show. Love Natalie. Love George. Big fan of all three. Now, I'm a big fan of my next guest, even though I would never, ever dream of getting in the ring with him, he is a former world champion at mixed martial arts. He is a fighter. And absolutely unusually, he's a Russian-American dual citizen and an activist with a very clear and loud voice on the war in Ukraine. He is Jeff Monson, and he is very welcome to the mother of all talk shows. Jeff, thank you for joining us. Sorry for the delay in connecting. Uh, first of all, tell us, roughly speaking, I wouldn't want to put you in any danger, roughly speaking, where you are right now and how the situation is. I'm in a city called Ufa, which is um, a little southeast of Moscow, about a two-hour flight. And um, things, things here are... You know, everybody's a little worried, especially since they had, you know, 300,000 people um, get called to active duty for the for the um, conflict in Ukraine. Um, and everyone's, you know, everyone doesn't know what's going to happen. And it has, you know, despite what, uh, um, you know, some media says that, you know, the economy, you know, has hurt. You know, it is hurting a little bit. So people are, regular people are suffering. So, 
Um, everybody just wants it to, to end, you know, because a lot of people have family in Ukraine. A lot of people are, are torn because they don't want this conflict. And, you know, the Ukraine and Russia were like, like brothers before this, this uh, conflict started. So everybody just wants it to end. Well, there's no uh, conflict like uh, civil conflict. There's no uh, side like fratre side. Uh, and that's, uh, of course, what we are seeing now. But the, the orchestrators uh, live far away from you, far away from Ukraine. And it's now clear that I've been saying, actually, for the best part of a year, uh, and even before that, that uh, if the Minsk agreement had been implemented, if Germany and France had insisted as they were entitled to, as the guarantors of the Minsk agreement, there never would have been a war. But Angela Merkel let the uh, truth out of our handbag this week, didn't she? America, um, and people might, you know, I'm obviously from America originally, and uh, my friends and colleagues and uh, family are shocked But uh, when I tell them this, but America started this war. And America is continuing this war by um, not only supplying Ukraine with weapons, um, but they've sent diplomats um, to Zelensky um, two times, one Boris Johnson and one from um, a representative of the United States. And, and they said um, explicitly, you cannot stop this war. You, you can't negotiate. You can't come to a peace agreement. Um, the United States has been supplying Ukraine. I mean, they want a weakened Russian. Uh, and they've, you know, they, they've done this for a long time. Um, back in 2008, Mr. Putin said, um, asking Ukraine to join NATO is a red line. You cannot cross this. Even um, Amer American businessmen, American diplomats, American um, from Congress said, this is a red line. We, we can't cross it. They knew it was a bad idea unless you wanted a war, unless you wanted conflict. And that's exactly what America wants. They, they want a weaken Russia. This is about American hegemony. Um, this is about weakening Russia and increasing American influence. Um, but not, not to go on so much about this subject with America, but I want people to understand what America is doing. America, first of all, they blew up the, they, been instigating this war they've uh, perpetrated this war for eight long years um they blew up the the nord 2 gas pipeline that was supplying europe and then america has come to the rescue america is now offering to supply europe which they're doing on um, gas but they're charging four times the market price four times so uh, america says that europe is their ally but they're they're hurting Europe. They're they're charging four times the the price of the current gas of price um, as Europe is struggling to decide whether to heat their homes or to buy food or um, or to live. So um, and then another thing that people don't understand is Venezuela. United States sanctions against Venezuela. Um, Venezuela is the largest um, has the largest oil reserves in the world, more than Saudi Arabia. Um, but sanctions have turned this country into almost a failed state at this point. People literally are, are struggling to, to eat in Venezuela, and they have more oil than any other country in the world. And this is because the United States has blocked any country from buying um, oil from Venezuela. So America has now just opened up um, buying because of the, uh, the oil crisis now. They've allowed Venezuela to sell oil only to america only america is the only one that's allowed to buy from venezuela they're not letting europe who they're struggling through a recession struggling through winter right now trying to heat their homes they won't even let europe buy oil from venezuela so this is just showing where um america's priorities are it's definitely not with anyone else other than america yeah, it's organized crime, and as you describe it, uh, I chuckle, although I want to cry. Uh, the, the fact that a state can behave like this and still claim to be on any kind of moral high ground and be looked up to uh, by people as, uh, as a moral leader, as a force for good, as the leader of the laughably described free world is uh, just ridiculous. But uh, 
Peter Hitchens, uh, an eminent uh, English writer in the newspapers this morning, makes this point, Jeff. If uh, Quebec broke away from Canada, as of course it could, and if an ultra-nationalist Quebecois government came to power there, began uh, first harassing, then outlawing the language of ultimately uh, driving out ethnically, cleansing, firing weapons at the English-speaking people uh, in Quebec, and then made an alliance with China, and then China began to move military assets into Quebec, 300 miles from New York City, and if those missiles included nuclear missiles 300 miles from New York City, how would America take that news? Of course, we all know how they would take it, at least those of us who know about the Cuban Missile uh, Crisis. But when you put it like that, Jeff, it's amazing that anybody continues to support the so-called Western side of this argument, isn't it? Well, it's... You make a good point. It's American hypocrisy, but the, the fact is, is that American media, um, the American government, doesn't allow the world to know about uh, Donbass, the, the, the former republics of Eastern Ukraine, and they don't allow um, the public to know. There, there are good people in America. I lived in America. There are good people in America. There are good people in Europe, but they can't make it. A, they can't make a, a a rational decision. A rational um, Unfortunately, we've lost Jeff Monson in mid-grapple, and it was all going so well. I hope everything's all right there, Jeff. Thanks very right. much for joining us. Okay. He's back. Jeff, you're okay. back. Okay, sorry. So I, went, I first went to um, Dunbass in 2016 from America, and I had no idea. It was, the conflict had already begun on for two years, and I had no idea what was happening like i was like i was shocked when i saw mortars coming over from ukraine and people civilians um the the airport uh, the hospital um apartment buildings being attacked every single day and for the last eight years um every single day ukraine has attacked these people and how why are they attacking these people because the people of lugansk and donetsk decided after a coup that they decided that they didn't want to be part of a West-leaning, um, like a government that that really had that wasn't even legal constitutionally. Um, they didn't want to be part of this. They're, they're out. Their language was outlawed. Their their books were taken away. Um, and their their textbooks from from school that had anything to do with Russia. So um, they wanted nothing to do with this. And the thing that also the Western media doesn't say is their um referendums they chose to be democratic they didn't fight they didn't say oh we're going to launch an attack we're going to fight the government no they did a democratic thing which america supposedly loves they had referendums and what it also is not point out these referendums are allowed under under the um constitution from ukraine they are allowed they are legal to have these referendums and this this is never reported. This is never talked about. That it's actually in the Constitution that the republics can have referendums to be um, continue to be part of Ukraine or be independent. And so they democratically elected over ninety three percent in both republics to be independent. And this is never reported. And the response from Ukraine: what what uh, what did they get for use of the democratic process? They got attacked. And and every year or every day, I'm sorry. Um, for the last eight years, they've been attacked. And my question is to to America, to people who are like, um, well, what if they shouldn't have done this? Is like, who is going to who is going to save them? Who is going to come to the rescue of these people who are being attacked? It was nothing short of genocide. And I can say this because I've seen it with my own eyes, and I've seen it a dozen times in a dozen different trips from 2016 to as as. Uh, recent as four months ago 
And every day, and these people tell us, it's not, it's not my words, it's not uh, Don Courtier's words, it's not the people from RT, it's not Russia, it's the people living the situation, their own mouths from their own eyes, showing us their apartment building, showing us the grave sites, showing us the mines that the Ukraine army laid in their, their schoolyards and um, orphanages, like, and blowing up their churches. It's, it's genocide, it's nothing short of genocide. And the world, not only did they even know about it, they, they, when they did know about it, they ignored it and pretended like it wasn't there. So it, it's it's American hypocrisy. Keep fighting, champ. We'll win. Jeff Monson, the former world champion MMA artist. My goodness, he looks like a powerful man and sounds like one too. Should Meghan and Harry have their royal titles cancelled? The great question of the day, and you need to answer it in the course of the next one hour. You're watching the mother of all talk shows, and I'll be right back after this very short break. The airwaves. This savannah is a rigid dichotomy of fact and fiction. As vicious as the Twitter sphere where the slightest misjudgment can spell being cancelled. One species rules over the airwaves through its ability to adapt and survive in even the harshest environments. The George Galloway. top cat in these parts, it is mostly active on Sunday evenings in Britain and mid-afternoon in the United States. It seldom roars during the day. Most notable for its wide variety of headdress, it protects these parts from the mainstream media. You can catch this fine specimen on the mother of all talk shows. Don't pick a fight with it. They've been known to bite back. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. I'll be taking calls in a minute, but uh, here's a Patreon uh, message from Doris Wrench Eisler. She says, U.S. power operatives are a cult of ghouls that live on drugged, spiked, cool aid and blood. This time Ukraine blood, but previous to that, Afghan and Iraq blood. And before that, African and South American blood, ad infinitum. Doris goes on, but it is in the most powerful terms. And, of course, it has the benefit of being true. Just in the last week, two U.S.-inspired coup d'etats have taken place in Latin America. The president of Peru has been overthrown and is under arrest, and the vice president of Argentina, and the favorite to be elected president, uh, next year, in 2023, Christina Kirchner has been lawfared out of the political game. She's been sentenced to six years in prison on bogus corruption charges, just like Lula in Brazil before her, for having influenced a procurement decision in the interests of a family friend. Just as well they don't have that law here, huh, Matt? Hancock. Uh, now, of course, I'm going to Sunderland in February. It's not that long now. I think it's nine weeks uh, until I'm in Sunderland uh, for the Mother of All Talk Shows road show. There it is. Uh, get your tickets uh, before they're all gone. Uh, it's, the, it's Tuesday, the 7th of February. I'll be in uh, Sunderland. Who knows? Might stay there for Valentine's the next week. Should Meghan and Harry have their royal titles cancelled is the question you can vote on now. 
Uh, let's take Michael in Minneapolis because he's always worth hearing. Michael, on you go, sir. What would you like to say? Hey, George. Well, I wanted to express my condolences for the World Cup match yesterday. I was pulling hard for your boys in England, and I just about draw. I think I just about felt you could have knocked me over with a feather when Harry Kane missed that second penalty. I could not believe it. Um, so anyway, I want to know how you're doing, what you think about the English squad um, with, after, you know, after yesterday's uh, unfortunate result, and who do you think is going to win the World Cup over, uh, ultimately? Well, look, if I, uh, if I could watch the England football team with the sound turned down, not have to listen to the mindless uh, nationalism of English football commentators, uh, I uh, could well get behind the England football team because, after all, uh, it is a team of splendid uh, young men, overwhelmingly, uh, whom I watch and support uh, every week in the Premiership, the, the best football division in the world. Uh, and some of them play for my own team. Uh, although Marcus Rashford got only four minutes last night, despite being the top England scorer, and that's inexplicable uh, to me. But uh, yeah, that seems I love crazy. the individual player. Yeah. I love the individual uh, England players, but I'd be a liar if I said I was supporting anyone other than Morocco now in the World Cup because they're the first African team, they're the first Arab team, they're the first Muslim team to make it into the semi-finals of the World Cup. And they, of course, are uh, emblematic now of all three. If you think of a Venn diagram, that is one mighty Venn diagram with Morocco right at the center of it. And I, I, I pray to God uh, that Morocco can defeat France uh, and, uh, and complete the hat-trick uh, of defeats against uh, the former European colonial powers. Uh, they never got the chance to defeat England, but if they had been playing England, I would have been with them. Uh, with uh, Morocco. Now, once upon a time, I didn't want politics in sport, Michael. Uh, but I'm afraid that day has gone because what we actually have had until now is none of my politics in sport, but plenty of other people's politics in sport. It was only my politics that were banned from sport. Well, now, no more. I am no longer hidebound by a uh, wish that, uh, that only the uh, best team should win. I want politics now to be in sport. I want sport to be making a political point, like it always has been just the wrong political point. But as it happens, the Moroccan team is so good, they could defeat France, and they could actually win the World Cup. It is possible. They have developed uh, 1970s, 80s Italian football uh, style called Zona Mista. And that style is perfectly tailored for the players that they have got. It's a style that a team without huge individual stars can play perfect and defeat others with. Now, as it happens... Morocco have discovered some uh, individual stars. Zayek up front, the Chelsea player, uh, but uh, the midfield player who plays for Fiorentina, but not for very much longer. If I have my way, it'll be at Old uh, Trafford, Arambat, uh, the midfield player of the, of the tournament, and their goalkeeper, my goodness, one of the goalkeepers of the tournament. So it's Viva Morocco all the way for me, Michael. Thanks for giving me the chance to say so. Tish is in Texas on the Twitter files. Go ahead, Tish. Hi, George. Actually, I'm back in California. Crazy California. <laughs> uh, I welcome. Just welcome. To, Marvelous. Go ahead. Wanted to uh, say that I'm not hearing people talk about the Twitter issue in regard to uh, Musk acknowledging the threat of an assassination on his life. 
Uh, that to me is should be on every station 24/7. Why is that even? Uh, why is he being threatened? Why would he feel, he shouldn't feel threatened for exposing the truth? And doesn't matter how anyone feels about Musk personally. Um, it's it's just crazy that that's an issue that he has to feel that threat. Well, he has a lot of money. If I were him and I had a lot of money, I'd be surrounded by uh, by a bodyguard of uh, Russian crack ex uh, Spetsnaz uh, troops, I'd, and especially in America where they can carry guns. I wouldn't, if I were Elon Musk, be moving anywhere without my person being fully protected because they are uh, setting him up for an assassination. The liberals and their control of the media and the rest of big tech have uh, uh, painted Elon Musk as a clear and present danger uh, to the country and the world that they thought they ran. They thought they were in control of forever. Uh, and uh, it only takes, as you know, in the USA, in California, uh, in that hotel kitchen, uh, uh, the, in Los Angeles, the murder of Robert Kennedy, may God rest his soul for, forever. Uh, the, it only takes uh, one or two guys with an automatic weapon in the United States to uh, rid the literati of this turbulent priest called Ethan, uh, Elon Musk. Thanks, uh, Tish, for the call. Nathan is in Seattle about the German coup. Go ahead, Nathan. Hi, George. Uh, calling you again for the first time. Uh, I talked to you. You um, uh, cut me off before I can make a point. You uh, made the point that uh, Britain was too inept to be into uh, the business of building empires. And uh, I want to uh, uh, speak to the fact that uh, India was controlled by the largest corporation at the time, uh, uh, East India Company. Now all of the biggest corporations are in America. All of the CEOs, like Bill Gates, get knighted by uh, your royalty. And uh, uh, my, my country is full of corporate whores, yes. But uh, London is the corporation. <laughs> but... Uh, after just making that idea, offer. Can I ask you, Nathan? No, but Nathan, can I ask you? Have you any idea how insignificant being knighted in London is? Do you think it puts potatoes on your plate? Do you think it gives you a free pass to go around the world? It's a meaningless affectation. On you go, back to you. Point, the point I was trying to illustrate was uh, the, the, the king builders now run things covertly. Like our CIA was, was uh, created uh, with the help of your intelligence agency so we could have uh, uh, our government run covertly. And the only president in my life or in my uh, understanding was, to go against the CIA was JFK and he was killed in broad daylight on television. I have like over 10, uh, 10 minute video addressing the stuff on my website, netflix.net. But I, I just wanted to uh, uh, reach out to you. And plus I heard you speaking of uh, the, the royalty, uh, Meghan Merkel and, and uh, Prince Harry or whatever. And my girl was just watching that show and it was extremely frustrating uh, hearing them uh, trying to be relatable <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, talk about their struggles. And There's money in it. Yeah, but but it was... Uh, Struggles in Monte... I, I, They're struggling yeah. in their palace in Montecito. Nathan, thanks for the call. I didn't All cut right. you off. I just had to move on because oh, I, I have understand. so I understand. many people who want to be on the show. Thanks a lot, mate. Simon is in London on the World Cup. Go ahead, Simon. Yeah, how you doing, George? This uh, weekend I was watching, believe it or not, Good. you will be uh, when, uh, when We Were Kings, a documentary about the Muhammad Ali fight against George Foreman in 1974. And it was a fight a bit like... Wonderful. 
Yeah, great. Well, best best documentary ever, I think, without doubt. It was a fight, like I said, that was typed for George Foreman to win. Everyone was was told George Foreman would win because he's younger, he's stronger, so on. He he destroyed uh, opponents that Muhammad Ali fought previously, Joe Fraser. You know, um, before the fight, a witch doctor in the documentary told one of the journalists that George Foreman had been cursed by some kind of a succubus, with a woman with trembling hands. And as the fight progressed, Ali and Ad, Ali adopted the now famous uh, rope a dope uh, tactics. Uh, George eventually punched his punched himself out, which uh, uh, Muhammad Ali capitalised on and, and beat Foreman. Now, to draw parallels, all week the media have been saying that the youth and the hungry England team will beat France and then eat Mark Mbappe uh, with the equally fast player Carl Walker. However, they seem to be so successful, successful at doing this, they completely forgot about Antonio Gri- Anton Griezmann, uh, uh, who provided us, uh, uh, both assists for the goal. You know, Mbappe. I mean, in my opinion, was just simply a Trojan horse that England fell for. However, I'm quite happy that with all the sig- uh, gesture signaling, sig- sorry, gesture signaling, they can now go home. You know, it's to me, it's good riddance. It, it would have been if they hadn't done all that kneeing and uh, the, the rainbow colours and all, 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 all the all the virtue signaling. You know. Um, uh, I, I would have had different thoughts, but because of that, it's kind of ruined the World Cup for me in in, in a way. Because um, normally I would support for it, I would try to support England as best I could, but with all that virtue signalling, it just hasn't left a bit of taste in my mouth, George. I don't know whether you feel the same way. Well, uh, no, not really. Uh, but I understand where you're coming from. Uh, I am not English and have no obligation to support their football team. I do support their individual footballers. Some of my favourites were on the park against France last night. Uh, But uh, I was not uh, distraught at the uh, English defeat, neither elated at the French victory. I'm now with Morocco and I am with Qatar and the World Cup 2022, which despite all the Qatar whaling critics, and the uh, virtue signaling warriors has been an outstanding, unbelievable success. It has been the most exciting, the most unpredictable, the most uh, form-confounding World Cup, uh, the most uh, disrespectful of status and placing in the international league tables and so on. World Cup of all time, and hallelujah uh, to that. Uh, I am very glad that uh, it's going to be an African derby between France and Morocco. Almost all of the French team are themselves of African origin. That's what happens when you go around making empires around the world. Some of the empires strike back and end up back in your country and in your football team. But I have no doubt which of the two African teams I want to see winning. Thank you, Simon, for the opportunity to say so. The result is enormous in this Meghan and Harry poll. I'll uh, come back to that. I need to take a quick break. Then it's our man at the World Cup, Isa Ali, although just like the England team. He's coming home. See you in a minute. I am, always have been, and always will be, firmly opposed to any changes in the law to allow assisted dying or assisted suicide. I believe the threat to the dependent, the most vulnerable, Um, the most desperate in our society is simply too great and therefore assisted dying or legalized assisted suicide must never become law in this country. Thank you, George. Thank you very much. Bravo. I I agree entirely and uh, spoke, uh, I hope, powerfully in Parliament against this euthanasia legalized murder. I have uh, the most profound feelings of opposition to it, which, as you say, does not mean that the pressures on people who are terminally ill, who have lost hope, 
are not uh, themselves profound and that the pressures on people without pay and without any kind of remittance or relief are condemned to years, decades of caring for people who are terminally ill, helpless, hopeless, and so on, that these are not deep, deep minds of anguish and of pain and of doubt. But I have a moral and religious obligation to oppose it. If capitalism was a person and it could kill anyone that it liked, it would kill the one that will never again turn a penny of profit. It's very easy to imagine. Relatives, even family members, even husbands and wives that would like to see the back of you, either because they think you've suffered long enough or because they'd quite like to see what's in your will and quite like to spend it. I wouldn't trust and I don't think you should anybody to decide whether you live or die. As a religious believer, I believe that that is God's job, not yours. This is a subject we'll have to uh, return. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Now, Blackfish on YouTube sends me the following message. Do you support the Moroccan fans trashing cities in celebration of their win, George? What does being African or Muslim have to do with playing soccer? I'm going to infer, as you use the inane word soccer for the game of football, uh, that you are a North American. I may be wrong. You may be British. If you are British, uh, then you've got a bloody cheek talking about the behavior of fans at international uh, football uh, tournaments. Because there's no city in Europe and beyond that hasn't been trashed by England fans in international competition, whether at club level uh, or at international level. But let me continue with my inference that you are an American. If you don't understand what is significant about an African team reaching the semi-final of the World Cup, then you are a very stupid American, and I know that there are some of those. Because that would mean that you had no idea that your country was built on the labor, the blood, sweat, and tears of Africans who were brought by slave traders, oftentimes British, in chains through the Middle Passage, in the bowels of slaving ships, and put to work in your country of America, in chains, in manacles, as slaves, as owned domestic beasts. And if you don't think that is of any significance, that that continent of Africa, colonized by all of the European powers and raped and murdered by those colonial powers, Leopold of the Belgians, beaten by Morocco in this World Cup, killed 15 million people in the Congo. If you don't know that, Blackfish, you joker, then you ought to be embarrassed to have written what you have written. Now, I haven't seen uh, any trashing of cities by the Moroccan crowds. And if there has been any, uh, then I deplore it. I did see the Palestinian supporters of the Moroccan fans being viciously assaulted in Jerusalem last night for celebrating the victory of Morocco. I did see millions of Moroccans all over their country in vast public squares, a poor third world country. I saw them filled with joy and rapture at the progress of their team in the 
World Cup. So, Blackfish, you're either a fool or a knave. You are an ignoramus or a churl. Or you may even be something worse than that. Let me talk to a man who I think has just touched down from Doha, from Qatar, FIFA World Cup 2022. He's our indefatigable World Cup correspondent. He's Isa Ali. Isa, welcome back. I think you are, uh, I see the Moroccan star behind you, uh, and I therefore infer you're feeling as good about Morocco as I am. Explain why. Oh, well, George, clearly, you know, I'm, I'm jumping on the bandwagon. I, I visited uh, Marrakesh a few years ago. Therefore, that makes me as Moroccan as anyone else. So I'm jumping on this bandwagon shamelessly and supporting Morocco all the way. And you've outlined the reasons uh, why, you know, look, at the end of the day, the West has made this, the Western media, the media in particular, have made this a very political uh, World Cup. But they've decided to draw their line in the sand with their virtue signaling nonsense. So uh, we're going to meet them on that ground and tell them that, yes, this is the most political World Cup there's ever been. And uh, in that vein, uh, we're all supporting the decolonial uh, forces, if you will, or the uh, nations pushing back against colonialism. We support our brothers in uh, Morocco. And uh, it's also been interesting to see the Moroccan players uh, waving the Palestine flag after every one of their victories, Moroccan fans, all the fans when I was there. I did a uh, touchdown back in London earlier this week, unfortunately, uh, back to the sunny weather here. Uh, but when I was there, everyone supporting Palestine, waving that flag and uh, a big uh, middle finger stuck up to the Abraham Accords that uh, maybe the uh, government in Morocco might want to consider uh, twice because that's the strength of feeling amongst their own people about the Palestinian cause. So, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, uh, a victory for Morocco is a, very, is a victory for the uh, African continent. Their coach said as much before that win over Portugal. He said, this isn't just for the Arab world, this is for Africa. It's not just for the Muslim world, this is for the whole continent. Uh, and so for that reason, of course, we do support uh, them. Now, of course, they're facing the uh, old enemy, the colonialist uh, tormentors of Africa, the biggest colonial tormentors of Africa in the French, who to this day continue to subject millions of uh, Africans to a life of poverty. And uh, if this victory can, uh, and this performance by the Moroccan team to even get this far, can give hope to those people, uh, then uh, we all get behind that. And it's more than, of course, just the football as well. Many, millions, if not billions around the world, hoping that that symbolic win in the football is a symbol of things to come. In the political sphere as well, a turning of the tide, a shift away from a collapsing civilization, a collapsing continent, and away to the global south and the east at the same time. Well, it is hard not to draw that metaphor. Uh, the tectonic plates are shifting in, uh, on multiple levels, it would seem, on the economic level, on the currency level, on the geostrategic level, the Chinese president visiting uh, Riyadh, uh, kissing and hugging with the, with the rulers of Saudi Arabia, all the other <coughs> Arab leaders uh, beating a path to Riyadh so that they can be in the picture uh, with the Chinese president. The, uh, the changing of the guard in the world is now being reflected uh, on the football pitch, isn't it? To a remarkable degree. I mean, it is because, you know, if, if you look at it even strictly from a footballing point of view, right? So, uh, you know, we all hope Africa can throw off the yoke of colonialism, neo-colonialism. Once the continent can start to develop itself, you know, they can start to invest in proper uh, infrastructure and in better staff and better uh, facilities for their players so that more football players choose to play for their home country. So, uh, uh, you know, rather than playing for a European nation that they were forced to live in or grow up in uh, due to, you know, situations back home. And, uh, you know, if you can get those types of players playing at home, that can be a symbol uh, of a result of uh, the economic development of Africa. And of course, there are parts of Africa which are hugely developing at, at such a fast pace. And of course, look, especially when you talk about Europe, it's a self-inflicted wound. It's suicide. It's political, uh, you know, shooting yourself in the foot. No one made them uh, stand with Ukraine and essentially sanction themselves. Uh, they decided to stand with neo-Nazi militias in Ukraine and uh, they're paying the price for it. They've sanctioned Russia's 
uh, oil and gas industry and essentially sanction themselves. There are now millions of people in Europe who are going to have a very difficult winter, if not uh, a few winters. There are some, uh, and I'm not sure I totally disagree with them, who say it could even be uh, part of a great reset, that this is a deliberate tanking of their own economies to build who knows what type of system uh, based on a you know central bank digital currency. Uh, whether it's deliberate or not, it is a collapsing civilization. It is a collapsing uh, economy, if you will. And uh, you know the Arab countries would be crazy if they didn't look to China and didn't look to other countries for their uh, future. Now, of course, all that has to be tempered by the fact that those same Arab leaders, many of them, if they haven't already normalized ties with Israel, are in the process of doing so. Uh, I believe Mohammed bin Salman has been the driving catalyst towards that end. And uh, hopefully, perhaps, this will be some kind of uh, break against that and the pushback against that. Uh, because the Zionist entity itself, uh, its days are numbered. And that's not just rhetoric. If you look at the demographic uh, chaos and the demographic crisis, that uh, the so-called state of Israel finds itself in, uh, that state's not going to be there for much longer in the way we recognize it today anyway. Uh, so uh, those nations as well and those leaders would do well to listen to their own populations uh, and adopt an anti-colonial and anti-imperialist stance, not just in their uh, you know, domestic policies, but their foreign policies as well. Is Ali, you've been a ray of sunshine for us from Doha. And now that you're back in the gloom of London, I hope we see much more of you in the weeks and months to come. Thanks for joining us Thanks, on sir. the mother of all talk shows. Should Meghan and Harry have their royal titles cancelled? A, yes, 20, 74. B, no, 26. On YouTube, yes, 73. No, 27. On Telegram, Yes, 71, no, 29. It's been an overwhelming response. It's still open, but it is overwhelmingly, three to one, uh, that the titles should be cancelled. Quick break, then it's your calls all the way to the end. Stay tuned. You know, and it's a very, thank you for, you know, I, I'm a big fan of your show, Gigi. Great, great debate, great. And I'm Scottish, I'm very passionate about what's happening there, you know. I had a great mom, she was Scottish, Mary McLeod. She taught me well. She taught me well at everything, including golf. I love Scotland and I love the Scottish food. It's great food, I said to Melania, you know, haggis, look at that. What's more than, more Scottish than that? Me, I am that haggis. She said, what, thin-skinned and full of crap? You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. I feel I know Donald Trump really well as a result of that sting. It is so brilliantly observed and voiced. I, uh, I almost feel that it's him. He did actually listen to a few of the shows on the uh, FM station in Washington that we used to broadcast on before the sanctions. I like to think maybe he tunes in on YouTube now and again. On Super Chat, Rudolf Grasspointer sends five euros. Thank you, Rudolf. Great minds think alike, you, me, and your guests. Indeed, John Carroll gives £1.79. They should have their titles taken away. Uh, Ian Robert Houghton, two pounds. Thanks, Ian. Jay Matson Heininger, five US dollars. Thank you. RL Zero, Five Canadian dollars. Should Prince Andrew's title be taken away? Stop picking on H and H. <laughs> Prince Andrew, moi, you're asking that of me? You're having a laugh. Uh, Payman Alien gives 20 US dollars from April and Lila. All the love to you, George Galloway. Thank you so much indeed. Eric Suarez gives five American dollars. Greetings from Mexico. Viva AMLO. And Rico611 gives 10 pounds. Mr. Galloway, I chuckled when the journalist couple said they listened to you on their drive. I'm likewise. Even in the gym or when jogging, you are somewhat my news source. Long live GG. I'm really touched to hear that. Especially as I have absolutely no idea what any of these things even are. Ershad Ali gives five pounds. Great show, George. Keep telling the truth. May God give you strength and long life. I mean, thank you, Ershad. 
and Geraldine Clifford gives 10 US dollars. Vincent is from High Wycombe, but that doesn't stop him wanting to talk about China, and he's most welcome. Vincent. Hi, George. How are you doing? Hi, go ahead. All good, sir. Thanks. Um, uh, you do really well um, criticizing um, Western war crimes. I think you do a good job doing that. But um, I think you should call that China. But I knew there was a but. <laughs> I knew there was a but coming. Yeah. What should yeah. I call out China? What should I call out China for, Vincent? Uh, the great leap forward when they um, tens of million people starved to death. Uh, in in what in famine you mean in the yeah. uh, in the past? Yeah. 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 Although it would be uh, somewhat hypocritical of me as a British person to do, as Britain was one of the colonial powers that raped China uh, for well over a century and caused the death of an uncountable number of Chinese people as a result of our colonial interference. It would be difficult for me uh, as a British person from a country that did nothing when Japan invaded China and raped and murdered millions of people. But if you are saying to me that uh, China has made uh, gigantic policy mistakes in the past, then I agree with you. Uh, and possibly not on the policies that you have in mind. Uh, but I shan't go back to the past because I think the present and the future is more important. Now, China is the hope of the world. That's why the Chinese president was in Riyadh. That's why all the African and Arab leaders were flocking to meet him. China has lifted 800 million people, not into famine, but out of poverty. The average Chinese person is now richer than the average European person. And when I was a child, Vincent, your mother would tell you to eat up that that's left on your plate. They're starving in China. Well, they ain't starving now. The average Chinaman is richer than the average European. And in the next 12 to 24 months, China will be the biggest and strongest economy in the world, in the whole world. And the days of Western empire uh, will quickly die. The sun is rising in China and it is setting, unfortunately, in the West. So I prefer to look at China from that vantage point. Vincent, thank you for the call. A robos very good friend of the show, is in New York, wants to talk about U.S. politics. Robos, most welcome. Greetings and salutations, Mr. Galloway. Thank you. Can you hear me? Very clearly. Thank you, brother. Your voice, your, yours is the, the Barry White of voices on the mother of all talk shows. Go ahead. There is no trick, only hard work, creativity, care, and recognizing that duty is more important than love. I'm sure you recognize that. Yes, of course. Well, shout Go out ahead. to your family and your loved ones. Um, I'll, I'll quickly preface um, that I do agree on the point that you made earlier about the, the politicization of, of football. Uh, more politics should be involved with it because I was moved by Isa Ali's reportage on all the people that he showed with the Palestinian flags and that's a serious movement from below that's always been there, but never really highlighted. So I agree with you on that point, and it's got me much more invested in football, what we call soccer here, than I've ever been before. Now, the, the main point of my um, perspective of my call is that there are two, two periods from 1945 to 1963, an 18-year period, and also from 1963 to 1981, another 18 year period. I can't attest to the numerological significance of that. But this the period I see from, from looking at um, post-World War II, when things in America got to the golden age, when, when all the programs that was implemented from the New Deal 
And, you know, all the immigrants came and people were living their best lives. And then the assassination of uh, JFK that you mentioned earlier, another mention, uh, uh, caller mentioned earlier. And so from 1963 to 1981, till Reagan came, I believe that vacuum that people left wide open and, you know, they were so comfortable from all the, the, the high quality of life that they never experienced hitherto for that period. I think they went to sleep and they were lulled in such a degree of complacency, it was hard for them to shake out of that. Because that 18 year period from 63 to 81 when Reagan um, was pushed in there, when that's when the corporate state uh, took over in the form of Wall Street. That was the period that people, like say the French would have been much more militant and they would have entered the government themselves and kept the country on course. And from 1981 till now, you can see the steady decline, the erasure of the New Deal programs, which excluded black people for the most part, but we were still able to, to benefit from the, um, the momentum and, and the side um, subsidies and things like that. But from that, that particular period, both 18 years, that's what I see is the decline of this country. And now it is such a state that the corporate state has basically created a a, a, ment a matrix, a mental, emotional, and spiritual matrix that has locked people, incarcerated people in the idea of, if it's not the official narrative, you can't believe it. And that will be, in my view, unless the people are, are, are snapped out of that deep sleep, that will be the destruction of this country. I have no doubt about that. So I just wanted to share this perspective with you. And of course- Well, I, I, I share it, uh, yeah. I, I really appreciate your call and the eloquence uh, with which you make points that I agree with entirely. And uh, maybe there's a case for a segment, maybe even a show on the uh, period that you described, because I lived through uh, some of these eras that you talked about as a, a politically cognizant uh, adult uh, political activist. And I have never been in any doubt that the dawn of Thatcher Reaganism was the beginning of the end. And we are still living in that period. Although more accurately, we are now beginning to die in that period as an economy, as a society, as a culture, as a place of significance in the world. Thanks for that call. Let's go to Sweden and talk with Alvi. He wants to talk about the US dollar. Alvi, welcome. Hi, welcome. Thank you for welcoming me. Um, how important is the value of the American dollar for what they are doing? And most of the money have gone to China. So they have built up China. What do you say about that? Yeah, yeah I agree. Uh, I once said to uh, Steve Bannon, the former Trump uh, right-hand man, maybe still uh, right-hand man, uh, that it wasn't China that stole America's lunch. It was American capitalism that took America's lunch and turned it into a takeaway uh, in Shanghai and in the rest of China. It was American capital that exported American jobs, American industry. Why blame China? What were they supposed to do? Say, no, keep it. We don't want it. So uh, the American dollar is now a Ponzi scheme based on nothing at all except uh, the expectation that in a turbulent world, the dollar is the place to keep your wealth, but not for very much longer as people de-dollarize. As I'm perfectly sure, uh, the talks uh, between the Chinese leaders and the Saudi leaders and the Gulf leaders in Riyadh this week have all been about, I fully expect, uh, Saudi Arabia to abandon the petrodollar. I think that the Saudi leadership, and I presume that it's MBS, the crown prince, that is in the van uh, on this, has decided that the tectonic plates are not just shifting, they have shifted, and it's time to get on the winning team. 
That's how I see these developments. Thanks, Alvi. Shapur is in London, wants to talk about Europe. Go ahead, Shapur. Uh, hi, George. Good evening. Good evening to you, sir. I just uh, want to <coughs> question, George, why the European leader, Europe is a big uh, continent uh, superpower. I want to find out why the European leaders were wagging their tails to America. Well, they're not leaders. Uh, that's the first point, Shapur. They are satraps. They are vassals. Uh, they are slaves to the American empire, either uh, willingly, in the case of the British leadership, uh, or unwillingly, in the case of the German leadership. The German leadership is uh, fully aware of the economic and soon social and political disaster that following Joe Biden on Ukraine has caused their country. After all, their, their factories are on their way to the, to the port uh, to be shipped to the United States. Their workers are being given green cards to come and operate them again. They're going to be left with the, uh, a deindustrialized country with millions of migrants and refugees within their territory. What could possibly go wrong, Shapur, I ask? If you don't know German history, of course, you might not get the significance or importance of that. But one way or another, uh, they have committed an act of national self-harm and in some cases, national suicide on our behalf. We are not blameless because we let them do it. We watched as they did it. Some of us even adopted the Twibbons in the chorus as they did it. But for the mass of the people in Europe, a long, cold, bitter, miserable, cold and hungry winter lies ahead. And it may not be the last of those kinds of winters. Shapur, thanks for the call. A uh, comment from Patreon, Justin, from Raymond Barker. So, Sterling and Rashford, Sacco, Bellingham, Arnold are not imperialist, George. They are black, successful young people who achieved the honor of playing for their country. Indeed so. Uh, they're only here. <laughs> they're only in England because of imperialism. And it's uh, one of the great ironies that the French team that lines up against Morocco at the weekend will overwhelmingly be African French people. Lawrence is in London. Go ahead, Lawrence. Hello, George. All the best, mate. Go ahead. A uh, couple of things. Firstly, you keep talk talking about your country, Britain. Um, yeah. I've never heard what is. I know there is Britain, which has three countries and a state of Northern Ireland. Um, but I don't know of a country called Britain. That's the first point. The I, second, I've known it all my life. I, I, <laughs> no, I've known it all my life. I've been a British passport holder uh, all of my life. Uh, Britain is an island, and I want to keep it as one island. Don't you? I do indeed, George, I do. With three nations. Okay, great. No, and I don't the... buy this nations. Uh, I don't buy the nations thing. <laughs> Uh, but uh, you, you buy it if you like. I'm a British citizen and intend to remain so. Uh, my passport is a British passport and I intend that it should remain so. You can believe what you like uh, about the nations uh, that you say are inside the British nation. I think after um, well over 300 years, we've actually got a British nation. nation. If you work on, uh, on the uh, Soviet constitutional definition of nations, which is actually, despite what you might think, a rather good one, a nation is an historically constituted, stable community of people with a common language, a common culture, 
and a common set of economic interests. I think that defines Britain. Over to you. Last word to you, Lawrence. Okay. Um, I would argue that that's not the case. I would say there are three very distinct communities. The English community really? in its Tell tradition. Me. All right. I'm, I'm, the I'm, wealth well, let, let me, community. Uh, let me ask tradition. you something. Let, no, let me ask you something. I'm sitting in Scotland right now. My children are in the living room watching the same television as your children in London. My older children are listening to the same music, mainly American, uh, that your children are in London. They're reading the same books. They're reading the same newspapers. My oldest child is a member of the same trade union, as you may very well be in London. Uh, we work for the same companies, often American, usually American, as each other in Scotland or in London. We speak the same language in Scotland as we do in London, although the difference in dialect between the English language spoken where I am now in Scotland and the English language spoken in Aberdeenshire is far, far, far more different than the difference between my accent and yours between Scotland and London. So I don't get where you're coming from here. You appear to be English, yet infatuated with an imagined national difference between the Scottish people and the English. I don't buy it. You can buy it if you like. You've maybe got a rainbow around your neck at the same time, do you? Let me explain, George. Go on. We can, we can have mutual interests, but we have very, there are very clear and distinct cultural, linguistic, the Welsh, the Scots not so much, but certainly the Welsh have held to yes. their language, their well, traditions. The Welsh, the Welsh maybe, but don't very, just keep... Very no, look, Lawrence, you keep... Lawrence, Lawrence, you keep asserting that, but you're not giving us one single example. Give me one single example cultural difference between Scotland and England. Just one. Okay. Uh, the language. The killed language of the, the pit of Scotland. The what what what, the, what, the what what language? What what language? <laughs> Celts don't have a language. If you're gonna if you're gonna go down the blood and soil route, at least get your terms right. There's no Celtic language. I, I presume you mean Gaelic. Gaelic is spoken in Scotland by fewer than 1% of the population of Scotland. More people speak Polish in Scotland than Gaelic. More people speak Urdu in Scotland than Gaelic. More people speak Punjabi in Scotland than speak Gaelic. More people speak Chinese in Scotland than speak Gaelic. So you're still struggling to give me one single difference between you, an Englishman, and me, a Scotsman. I'll ask you one more time. Just give me one. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go to the point I want to really make, which was about the English football kit, which really, really annoyed me. If you look at all, if you'd looked at all the other teams, the kit were very reflected of the colours of the country. In the English kit, the English flag is white and red, no other colours. You could not see a drop of red on that kit. It was blue. Well, I'll and take your white. I'll, I'll take your word, uh, Lawrence. I'll take your word for it uh, because, frankly, I didn't look at them as closely as you did. Ray is in Wales on Palestine. Go ahead, Ray. Hi, George. Um, great show as usual. Uh, I made my weekly usual Thank contribution. I'm afraid it's only a pound, but that's all I can afford. Uh, but keep Thank a good you. work up. No, uh, one pound a week, one pound a week is perfect, Ray. Okay, God bless well, you just, for it. I've, I've just finished reading a fantastic book. You may have read it uh, by uh, Alain Pepe called The Biggest Prison on Earth. And in the dedication, it says... 
I'd like to dedicate this book to all of the Palestinian children killed, wounded and traumatized by living in the biggest prison on earth. My question to you is, do you think we are any closer to uh, solving the problem in Palestine? No, uh, I'd be a liar if I did. The one thing I'll put to you is this. I was, for decades, a close friend of the late and great Yasser Arafat, the foundational president of uh, the Palestine cause and its international reach. When I uh, was at his bedside in the Percy Military Hospital in Paris, his deathbed, I came out after he passed and there were thousands of cameras outside. And I thought to myself, my friend was physically a very small man. The Palestinian people are demographically a very small people. By all rights, they ought to have disappeared and their leadership be of no consequence to anyone, never mind the cameras of every country in the world. And Arafat used to say, he said it 10,000 times, we are not the Red Indians. We will not go into a museum where people can visit and look at our costumes and our artifacts. We are a live people with a live cause that we will keep alive for as long as is necessary. And Arafat did that. And the Moroccan national football team are doing that. The Moroccan football fans are doing that. The Arabs and the Muslims and the Africans flying their flags are doing that. The Western sympathizers with the injustice done to the Palestinian people are doing that. And above all, the Palestinian people themselves have never been prepared to go into that museum. Whether under siege in Gaza, starved of food and water and medicine and exit and entrance and the sea and the air around them, being completely, as Ilan Papi, the great Israeli historian, has put it, as you have just quoted, being prisoners in the largest prison in the world or under occupation in Jerusalem at the Damascus Gate last night, out supporting Morocco in the World Cup and being gassed and clubbed and shot by the occupation forces in holy Jerusalem, at the Damascus gate, where Jesus walked, or under occupation in the West Bank, or in exile around the entire world. Everywhere you go, there is a Palestinian not far from you. Their people have been scattered to the four corners of the earth, but they have never surrendered. And as long as you never surrender, you are not defeated, even if it might be 50 or 500 years before you triumph. If you did not surrender your rights to that land that was stolen from you, if you do not accept your extinction as a people, if you do not put down your pen, your weapon, your voice, your microphone, your activism, your consumer purchasing power, all the things that we all have to continue that struggle, then you have not been defeated. And the Palestinian people, in my view, will never be defeated because they will never surrender. The flame that was lit and kept lit 
by Yasser Arafat burns brighter today than it has done for some considerable time. Uh, but it will not liberate Palestine alone and it will not liberate Palestine anytime soon. But I fully believe that my children or their children will walk in a liberated Palestine. And all I ask of anyone who meets them there is that you tell them you remember their father. Thank you very much for watching this, the Mothership, the Sunday night edition of the mother of all talk shows. The good news is I'll be back, God willing, on Wednesday at 9 p.m., 9 p.m. UK time with the midweek edition of Moats. Brought to you thanks to the sponsorship of Critical Cosmetics. Check them out. And if you can sponsor the second hour of our Wednesday show, don't forget to get in touch. It's been marvelous. Have a good night.